to continue reflecting on the life and legacy of the last apartheid president, former uh, President F.W. Duclerc. We're joined by former Democratic Alliance leader Tony Leon, associate professor at the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy at the Nelson Mandela University, Professor Christy van der Westhuizen, and former president of Azapo, Musibudi Mangena. Good evening to all of you, and thank you so much for your time. Already we've heard from uh, the voices that we've played just slightly earlier very different messages about what the legacy of F.W. Dittler is. Perhaps in your own words, an opportunity for you uh, to weigh in and reflect on his life for me. Uh, Professor van der Westhuizen, let me begin with you. Well, uh, as I've written today in an article in, in News 24, uh, President de Klerk, um did have this uh, unique um, characteristic in the sense that he, that he actually unified his enemies across ideological lines uh, in, in terms of, of how they viewed his role during the transition. What um, reactionaries regard him as somebody who, who basically capitulated without defeat, who gave up Afrikaner of power, uh, while black radicals uh, believe that he led a team of, of ingenious um, negotiators that managed to, to hoodwink the ANC into uh, constitutionalism and thereby, um, in a sense, robbing South Africa from a, of, a, of a proper revolution, a proper transition. To, to social justice. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, but, but for me, I think that, that what, what's important about the Clark was that he um, stepped in at the right time. Uh, if we, we have to think about the context of the time, we have to think about his predecessor, P.W. Boerta, and the extent to which P.W. Boerta was willing to hold on to white minority power. And it was very clear that, that Boerta's position hardened in the late 1980s and that he was um, increasingly moving towards um, uh, adopting a, 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 military, a, a purely military solution to, to the situation in South Africa. He stepped away from his own apartheid reformism that he'd started. And, and the CLAC, um, in fact, had the courage, we both or lacked the courage, to actually take that step and to, and to make that, that famous speech on, on the 2nd of February 1990 that really put South Africa on the path to a constitutional democracy. Mm. Mr. Leon? Well, I think to understand the context of F.W. de Klerk and his times, uh, my first day in Parliament was the 2nd of February 1990, and I'd been elected for the Liberal Democratic Party from a liberal seat called Houghton in Joburg, and F.W. de Klerk was this Conservative National Party leader, and he fought the campaign against the Democratic Party, was on the basis that the DP was treating with the ANC, and then in a 40-minute speech, of quite remarkable intensity. I mean, we're still feeling its after effects today, all these years later. He, in the words of Franzel Slubitz, uh, turned his back on 46 years of national party dogma, which was entirely correct. So I think there's a, an interesting and entirely correct debate about what motivated him. But I, I think given the epoch of change that he introduced, and he did have all the formal power on the 2nd of February 1990, a lot of the informal power, of course, was outside his control. It was an extraordinary moment. And I always said of F.W. de Klerk, and I wrote today for something for uh, the News 24 for tomorrow, I, I said that the thing about him was that he was the first National Party leader since they uh, obtained power in 948 who could read the writing on the wall and not assume it was addressed to someone else. So he actually did seize the initiative. And, and, you know, it, it might very well be, as a lot of people say, well, he intended to control the process and he had in mind a long, drawn-out transition. Well, that didn't work out. But, but actually, he was the necessary change agent. Obviously, we had this, you know, hugely consequential leadership of Nelson Mandela on the other side of the divide. But you've got to bear in mind that it took between Mandela's imprisonment in 1964 and de Klerk's speech in 1990 for the two divides to even hear each other, never mind be in the same room as they shortly were thereafter. So, so I think it is a very significant legacy. Um, you know, there, there are two parts to it, because correctly people say, oh, well, he was a servant of the apartheid regime. Indeed, he was a, a prince of the National Party establishment. His uncle, J.G. Stratum, was the hardline National Party prime minister in the 1950s. His father, Senator Jan de Klerk, was a leading uh, National Party Minister under H.F. of Wirtz and John Forster. So actually, the apostasy or the U-turn was all the more extraordinary 
because it came from this prince of the National Party establishment than it would have been if someone had been, uh, you know, outside of it. And, you know, I also think it's worth remembering that the change that came to South Africa between 1990 and 1994 happened at the precise moment that, or just shortly afterwards, that Mikhail Gorbachev had introduced his reforms in the Soviet Union. And not just they had similar hairstyles, but Gorbachev and de Klerk were very improbable change agents, but they probably didn't intend for their system to be dismantled, but they at least had the pragmatism to accept the consequences of what had been unleashed. And, and I think that that is considerable, and we can have an argument and discussion about everything else, but that to me does say quite a lot for the man and the moment at which they met. Mr. Mangena, let me give you a chance to also give perhaps your, your initial remarks and uh, reflections on the life of F.W. de Klerk. Well, de Klerk has got um, a mixed legacy. Um, like most of his uh, colleagues in the National Party, um, he was a, a brutal oppressor to uh, a lot of black, black people for a very long time. And many of us suffered in the in the townships and villages uh, from that oppression, the beatings, the arrests, the torture, and 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 of course uh, some uh, amongst us uh, lost their lives. And so the the however the the uh, the his uh, uh, ability to recognize that. Uh, that kind of oppression, that apartheid was unsustainable. Um, it did help a great deal. Now one of us knows what would have happened if uh, he didn't act in the manner in which he has acted. We would probably have had a civil war. And in civil wars are terrible things. And you will never know where it would have ended. Nobody would have uh, predicted what that civil war would have yielded. Uh, there are many of us who believe that uh, probably it will still be going on now and uh, the country might have been a wasteland by now. So there it's mixed. Um, uh, his, his, his recognition that time was up um, is something that um, uh, is positive in his legacy. Mm -hmm. Professor van der Westhuizen, earlier on on this channel, Mac Maharaj weighing in on the legacy of former uh, President F. W. de Klerk, really reflecting on the times of the transitions, some of the negotiations that took place. He described Mr. de Klerk as somebody who was never able to truly cross the Rubicon in the sense that, yes, he was he was pivotal in introducing that moment of transition, but never quite followed through in terms of transformation and at least the overall transformation that would have needed to take place in this country. And in fact, went as far as saying that he believes that he pulled out of the government of national unity because he didn't fully support uh, the country's constitution. Well, uh, I, th I do think that uh, uh, de Klerk was a reluctant uh, constitutionalist, as I think uh, most of the National Party people were at the time. They, they were definitely not, uh, when, they, when they entered into the negotiations, they were definitely not foreseeing a constitutional democracy with equal rights for all and human dignity as a central principle and, and freedom as a central principle coming out of it. Uh, they, they went into the negotiations with de Klerk you know, at the helm, wanting a... a um, a, a situation or a, or a dispensation of, of power sharing that would have involved a white veto and they wanted to create a, um, a, a, a house in, uh, in parliament to enable that. So, so by the, by the, at the start of the negotiations they were definitely not constitutionalists and I, and I, and I do think that, that uh, the fact that the clerk was a pragmatist um, uh, plays a big role here in the sense that he was, he was um, in a sense the, the if, if, one, if one thinks at the speed of, of which things were starting to unfold, um, we, we must remember that 1990 to 1994 was the period where, where most people died ever in, in the whole uh, apartheid era, actually. So, so the, um, and, and if we think of all those uh, um, incredible uh, incidents of, of violence, if we think of, of the state violence, if we think of o the overt and the covert state violence, if we think of, of violence, 
generally the IFP, the ANC, and so forth and so on, you know, things actually started to move at, at a speed where, where the National Party people, including the CLAD, was trying to keep up with it. And eventually, um, at least uh, from, a, from a pragmatic point of view, realized that the only viable option for them is to, is to opt for, for constitutional democracy. So, but I, I, I don't think that they were 100 percent, or he at least was, was 100 percent um, convinced. I think in that sense, Mark, Mark Maharaj is, is uh, correct. But he definitely did not believe that the, the, the option that the, the reactionaries within uh, the National Party cabinet was, was uh, putting on the table that that was in, in any way uh, viable. And we must also remember that at that point in time, uh, we, you know, Constant Fulyun was playing a very particular role with the other uh, South African Defence Force generals. They were looking, actually, they were, they were seeking or, or looking for ways to actually sustain a white minority government through violence. And, and fortunately, the, the, the so-called invasion of Bukitotswana was, was, a, was an extreme uh, flop and, and brought Fu Yun uh, to his senses. Mm. But the clerk uh, himself did not support that. So, 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 so the clerk basically shifted. He, he was convinced that the, the military option, the state violent, uh, state, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, oppressive powers of the state being, being uh, 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 enforced would not actually be ultimately a solution. And that's why he, 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 um, he opted for the government of national unity. I think that, that we also have to remember that he, uh, he was never, because of this, of, of this family legacy that he comes from, and, and as somebody who was really very deeply socialized into Afrikaner nationalism, you know, from a young age, uh, he was also, he was in all the various Afrikaner nationalist movements that you can think of. He was a member of the Bruderbund and so forth and so on. He was thoroughly socialized in that mindset. So it, uh, he could not ever really accept until the end of his life that apartheid um, was essentially a, a, a brutal and dehumanizing mm -hmm. system. And he, he always came over and, and, and uh, as an apologist for apartheid right to the end. I mean, uh, most recently there was another controversy where he, where he again rejected the notion of apartheid as, as a crime against humanity. So it is interesting that it seems now with this final video that he made that he, that he, he seems to have uh, I unfortunately wasn't able to see the video, but that, that he seems to have backtracked perhaps now right at the end from that position. But he held that position where he could not really accept the, the, um, the dehumanization that apartheid had, and, and, and the wreckage that apartheid had caused, the incredible damage that apartheid had caused. He would not really accept that. Yeah, look, that, that video has drawn very different reactions, Professor van der Wethesen, but I'll give you a chance to have a, a look at it and, and we can pick it up in another conversation. Uh, Mr. Leon, this idea that there was this Damascus moment and very much in this last message to South Africans, um, one can hear the former president describing it uh, as such, that there was a, a change of heart uh, in terms of his opinion around apartheid and that he apologized apologizes to uh, South Africans for the pain that he had caused. Many people still don't seem to believe um, that that is a sincere message. And again, I feel that he's still very much an apologist for apartheid. Do you think it, it'll ever be possible to separate de Klerk from apartheid, given, as you put it, that he was the prince of, 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 of the National Party? Well, I think there were three phases. I, I mean, I, you know, de Klerk always reminded me of that Walt Whitman poem, I am large, I contain multitudes. Uh, do I contradict myself very well? I contradict myself. So, you know, the first phase of de Klerk is well known. Although the interesting thing to me when I, when I was thinking about F.B.A. de Klerk and his legacy is he was the uh, first National Party president or prime minister in a, a long time. You had to go back to 1966 where he wasn't involved in the security cluster because John Forster was the Minister of Police before he became Prime Minister. Pierre Villabuerta, as Christie said, was the Minister of Defence before he became President. And de Klerk was a Minister of Education and being the Minister, the minister of the Interior and Mines. And all. So he didn't actually come from this securocrat mindset, even though we, I think there's a, a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of evidence that the security forces played a less than uh, objective or honourable role in the transition. And therefore, he could do things perhaps that others wouldn't do. He fired, I think, 19 generals uh, on the eve of the change in South Africa who were seen to be change resistant. 
So, I, you know, I, I thought that was very interesting. But once he became president and he had the, uh, he had the gumption to do what he did, he, I think, thought that this is all coming up roses. And it was doubly so in 1992 when to deal with his own right wing in the white community, he had the referendum, which he got a two-thirds vote to carry on with the negotiations. And then I think he made a miscalculation. He assumed somehow that uh, all he had to do was uh, carry on and, and uh, the, the national parties have all the advantages. And actually, the advantages, both the weight of history, the legacy of apartheid, and just the sheer weight of, of, of both uh, internal numbers, external uh, pressure, meant actually the initiative switched from the NP to the ANC. And at that point, just to emphasize something Christie said, he took a pragmatic view. He did have all these fancy, unworkable plans about minority vetoes and rotating presidents, but they were just quietly ditched. De Klerk then switched negotiators, brought in a far more emollient Rulf Mayer to help, if you like, grease the wheels of surrender. I suppose they wouldn't see it like that. And, and as we say, the rest is history. Uh, strange enough, uh, apart from the contretemps, which, which I, you know, I, I interrogate in the book I wrote this year about the apartheid as a crime against humanity, which I think is well known to viewers, to me, the, the most interesting and some would say saddest phase of FBI's life was when we were all in the Democratic Parliament, and he was the deputy president alongside Tobo and Becky, and he described his participation in the government of national unity as living on a form of political death row, was his words in his biography. And I thought, well, maybe if you'd got the ground rules sorted out before the constitution was finalized or you made an agreement, you might have had a better time. But, but look, this is to argue on a lot of very important detail. But I think if you would take away the headline, and, and just to my old uh, comrade, if I can call him that, from Parliament, Mr. Mangena and I, I mean, I, I do think South Africa would be in where Syria is, or possibly Venezuela today, if we didn't have that change, and if the if the if the president of the Anshan regime, who was de Klerk, who had all the formal power, hadn't in four years gone from having all the power to basically surrendering power. Now that I think giving up power for whatever reasons, whatever motives, mixed, bad, good or indifferent, is unusual in the political world. Mr. Mangena, let me come to you and perhaps wrap it up here. There will be lots of conversations around accountability and the extent to which uh, the former president was actually accountable for what did take place um, under his watch. And also and under Parte, there seem to be uh, a lot of questions uh, around that. Do you think that he was as forthcoming as possible with the information that was needed to truly reconcile this country, but also help to give the families of those who had suffered at the hands of an apartheid regime some form of closure? No, unfortunately not. And uh, um, I wish that the, the, the uh, uh, investigations and prosecution of uh, apartheid uh, players uh, moved apace and, and, and that he had had a chance uh, while still alive to participate in that. Maybe we might have seen more of his colors. Uh, but to, I did see the, the, his, his last video. Uh, he has moved further uh, than, than where he was a, 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 just a few months ago. You remember that he had said that uh, he doesn't agree that uh, apartheid was a, 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 a crime against humanity. And, and today, he, he, he apologized, and what I saw in the, in the video, he apologized without conditions. And uh, so he's, he's a very complex and, and, and difficult man to, to, to understand. Uh, but I, I, I do think that uh, uh, basically um, we, 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 we've got to understand him as, as, as the man who moved us, moves us to where we are uh, uh, presently. So, so I, th I think that's all. He's, he's, he, he was a rather complex character mm -hmm. at, at an individual level. And, but what remains is that um, he was part of this very cruel and brutal uh, system of oppression. Let's leave it there for tonight. The former uh, president of Azapo, Musibudi Mangena.
former Democratic Alliance leader Tony Leon, an associate professor at the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy at the Mandela University, Christie Funder Vestazen.